Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Lindsay Smith Rogers, Hospital Infection Control 2024 edition. Dr. Lisa Maragakis is a professor of medicine and epidemiology and the senior director of infection prevention at Johns Hopkins Hospital. She joins Dr. Josh Sharstein to talk about what hospitals are doing to address contagious respiratory disease and the fallout of the pandemic four years after COVID came to town. Let's listen. Dr. Lisa Maragakis, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me today. It's great to have you back on the podcast. You were one of our very first guests back in March 2020. We called you to hear about your work in charge of infection control at Johns Hopkins Hospital. You were getting ready for the pandemic to really hit. That's right. I recall it very well. And it does feel like somewhat of a time warp to realize that four years have gone by. I, I was in your office in person, I think, for that one. Yes, yes, we met there. And of course, our team was on site. A lot of people were starting to shelter at home, but our team was was in full swing of doing the emergency preparedness and response for the pandemic. Well, we're not going to look back too much, but I do remember being struck by how calm you were at the time and how you had a plan for a significant respiratory pathogen. And I know that you worked unbelievably long hours over the following few years to implement that plan, and it was very successful at Johns Hopkins. So I really can't miss the opportunity to thank you for all your work. Well, thank you so much for saying that. We had incredible colleagues and I'm very proud of the way that we were able to respond as as a team and really help not only our patients, but the broader community through a very difficult time. So today I want to ask you about how things are settling out. First of all, if they're settling out a little bit, we're four years later, and then how they may be settling out, what has changed, what hospital care looks like. You know, you're still trying to keep people from getting infections within the hospital, keep everybody safe. Where do you want to start? Well, that's a big topic. I can say, thankfully, a lot has changed. And I think everyone is feeling that we have now moved into a post-pandemic phase, which is wonderful. It took much, much longer than I anticipated that it would. Of course, if I had studied history, I should have known that it would be several years before we started to feel like this. What are we seeing in healthcare right now? Well, we are still seeing certainly cases of COVID-19, patients who require hospitalization. The vast majority of those, however, are unvaccinated individuals or people who have underlying medical conditions that make them especially vulnerable to the virus. One of the biggest things I would point to, however, is that we are dealing with the disruption in healthcare that the pandemic wrought largely on society, but especially in healthcare settings. So we have seen the resurgence of patient safety and quality challenges, including healthcare associated infections. And by this, I mean not COVID, I mean central line associated bloodstream infections, surgical site infections, the kind of bread and butter work that we do in infection prevention. And those challenges are bigger, I think, than they were before the pandemic. We were making tremendous progress before the pandemic, and we've had some setbacks. So does this have to do with just the immense focus that COVID required? Yes. I think initially it was the immense focus that COVID required. It was the disruption of the influx of so many very sick patients with COVID. So there were some factors there about patient acuity and the disruption of the workforce as we struggle to handle the volume and acuity. But now I think it's a larger, much larger disruption in our workforce. We've lost a lot of key individuals. We've gone through periods of tremendous turmoil in terms of staffing in the hospital. 
not just doctors and nurses, but really across the board of healthcare providers. And that is starting to stabilize somewhat now, but we've had periods where we've relied on temporary personnel from agencies and outside organizations. And now we have, we're really thrilled to have them, but an influx of new people joining the workforce and they don't have as much experience. These are some of the challenges facing us as we try to ensure safe, high quality care and evidence-based practices. Let me ask you about where COVID is right now. You know, for a long time, there were a lot of rules about COVID in the hospital. Where does that stand? In the healthcare settings, we still have a tremendous amount of rules. We're still um, being quite cautious. And of course, that is because we have very vulnerable population of patients who are hospitalized, who have underlying medical conditions, often immunosuppression and other things. And we also have Unfortunately, in healthcare, a lot of ways that pathogens can be transmitted from patient to patient or healthcare personnel to patients. So we still have a lot of precautions in place, both for our healthcare personnel and also for our patients. It doesn't look exactly like it did during the pandemic, though. We've certainly, I think, moved more towards a universal approach where we're taking the lessons learned from the pandemic and applying them to respiratory viruses in general. We've always had many, many patients during the winter months with influenza and RSV or respiratory syncytial virus, for instance. So what do those precautions look like? Like if we were to walk around the hospital, what would you be doing differently now on the other side of COVID compared to where things started? Well, when things started, of course, there was a tremendous amount of fear and the case numbers were extremely high and we didn't have the vaccine. <laughs> so the fact that the vaccine is here and we have such widespread immunity now amongst the population, not only our patients, but also our healthcare personnel, that is the game changer. Early in the pandemic, we built special units that had very special air handling and people put on respirators to even enter those units. We no longer have that situation. Now we're relying on our, what I would call our more normal approach to infection prevention. And we do have what we call airborne isolation rooms, which have special air handling and filtration, but not those big units that we built during the pandemic. So that's one of the changes. Another change I think is in the testing. And testing for COVID-19 was a huge hurdle that we can talk a lot about the challenges that we had along the way. But now we've come to a place where we're relying in the outpatient settings on home testing. Our personnel are relying on home testing and we're reserving those PCR tests really for hospitalized patients. Do you routinely test patients? Are there certain times when you ask people to test before they come in? During the pandemic, there was a long period of time where we were testing everyone, recognizing that a lot of the transmission is from asymptomatic carriers. We are no longer doing that. So we are now testing according to symptoms and epidemiologic links that would raise a suspicion for COVID-19. What about if people have had COVID? It's been a little controversial for the general public. When do you have your employees come back to work? Right. So our employees, even before the pandemic, were not allowed to come to work when they had a febrile illness. So if they have fever, they need to stay home. We also, before the pandemic, had a rule that employees personnel needed to wear a mask if they had respiratory symptoms and they were coming to work if they didn't have fever. So those two rules still apply. But what I think you're asking me about is requiring our personnel to stay home if they have COVID-19. So we do have them stay home for five days after they test positive for COVID-19. Now, I mentioned that we're relying on home tests, so there's a lot of variability in the use of home tests or whether people are actually even testing themselves. So I would say that we've gone back to where the backbone of our policy is still that don't come to work with a fever, wear a mask if you have any type of respiratory symptoms. And I would say you don't even have to know that, that those respiratory symptoms are COVID-19 because throughout the pandemic, we know that 
people might have mild symptoms and think that they're having allergies or they just have a cold or something. But the safest thing, particularly in the healthcare setting, is to wear a mask so that you're not transmitting whatever it is that you have to someone else. Got it. And how has your approach to vaccination evolved? I know that even before the pandemic, influenza vaccination was required for people who work in the hospital. What's the COVID picture look like? Right. So we do still require annual influenza vaccine for all of our personnel. And for Johns Hopkins Medicine, we do require COVID vaccination as well. So the vast majority of our personnel were vaccinated when the vaccine came out and, and it was required. Of course, we're always having influx of new personnel who are joining our organization and they do need to show proof that they were vaccinated at some point. If they were not vaccinated, then we would give them the latest version of the vaccine. So there's a return to a number of universal practices. There's now an additional vaccination requirement. The hospital rhythms are returning a little bit to the pre-pandemic rhythms. What do you think the lasting mental health impact is for the people who you work with? I think it's been enormous. A great deal of disruption, as I described it, a lot of stress. This whole event has been extremely stressful for certainly anyone who, you know, is in infection prevention or internal medicine or worked in these units, our nurses, our respiratory therapists. I'm sure the variation of individual stories is quite broad, but we share a sense of disbelief of what we've been through. I would imagine that the society at large has some degree of that as well, but in healthcare, it's quite intense. And I mentioned earlier the staffing crisis. I think many have left our profession or chose to retire or do something different. Hopefully, we will be on steadier ground going forward and move beyond this and incorporate. My hope is we can really incorporate the lessons that we learned and move beyond that kind of feeling of being shell shocked. Right now, I do feel like if you equate it to kind of a natural disaster, we're still in the cleanup phase where we are trying to pick up the pieces, both emotionally and also of all the work that remains to kind of get back to where we were and move forward. Right. Stabilize the staffing, stabilize the regular processes and continue to strengthen protections against respiratory disease at home and within the hospital. It's a lot of people outside healthcare, you know, maybe can forget that COVID is still around in the world, but people who are in the hospital don't have that opportunity. Well, that's right. It's still this respiratory virus season had a big impact on our hospitalization rates, on our personnel, on our patients. And one thing I've come to realize is throughout the pandemic, I think part of the communication challenge that we had and getting everybody kind of onto the same page as much as possible is that so much of the disease was asymptomatic or mild. So while we had the shared experience of the initial fear of what it would mean for any individual, as more and more people experienced mild disease, that feeling of reassurance and confidence returned for increasing numbers of people. And I think one of the differences, you know, in healthcare is, of course, we see the most vulnerable people. And so we have to keep a different lens or we have a different lens on what this virus means and other viruses mean for those most vulnerable individuals in the healthcare setting. And it's our responsibility to think about that and protect people from the, the most severe consequences that happen to the fewer people. Well, thank you again for all of this work. We all owe you a great deal for taking on that responsibility. And thanks. It's great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Grace Ciceri. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Spencer Greer, Matthew Martin, and Philip Porter, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo.
social media run by Grace Cesiri and Eliza Rosen. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening.